You know, who would have thought that that's what God would have, how God would have done what he did? You know, sold into slavery, becomes some man's property. You know, pretty grim looking uh, prospects for the future going on there. You know, or, or, or the story there where Peter is asked whether or not he and Jesus are going to pay their taxes. You know, uh, and Jesus sends him out fishing, and he comes. You know, he tells him when the first fish that comes up, you know, he's going to cough out a, a gold coin for you. <laughs> he's asking gold pay for you and me. I mean, God does things that way. You know, uh, George Mueller. If you read those story of the life of George Mueller. A uh, man had orphanages in England, and I mean, it's just amazing the amount of money that went through that man's hands that God would bring to him because of his prayers and his humility. You know, there's the, the, the one story, I always like the one story there uh, uh, about how, you know, there's nothing to feed the kids that morning. You know, and so he's praying, you know, and he's saying, these are your children. <laughs> these are, you know, you got to take care of them. And, you know, you've got a, 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 a milk wagon that loses a wheel out there, you know, and uh, I forget what happened there with the, the bread, but all of a sudden they just, they've got all this bread and milk that morning. Kids are sitting there at the table, ready to go. You know, and God says, need to provide. He provides. You know, uh, God, you can't outgive Him. You can't outgive Him. You know, and again, this is what God looks at is the motive of the heart in doing things. Now, the principle in the New Testament regarding giving is free will. Okay? Nothing is obligatory. There are principles we can take from the Old Testament as guidelines in doing things. But the New Testament principle is free will. It's all about free will. Your salvation is about exercising your free will. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16, last chapter of 1 Corinthians First three verses. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality under Jerusalem. Second Corinthians chapter eight. Second Corinthians chapter eight, one through five. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us, by the will of God, drop down, pick it up at verse 10 through 15, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So they were going to do the same thing in Corinth. Okay. Now therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, 
It is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Remember the widow of points? What Jesus said? You know, she's given more than them all because she gave her whole living. It's not about the amount. It's about the heart. And it's about the motive behind the giving. For I mean not that other man be eased and you be burdened. But by equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. I mean, the perfect example of this is a few years ago. Uh, when we sent money to brother, well, brother Bob Utley and New Testament Baptist Church down in uh, Kannapolis, North Carolina. It had come to us through Brother West that they were in a really bad financial situation. God had blessed us tremendously at that time, incredibly at that time. And so as a church, we decided to send them a free will love offering to help them out. And what a tremendous blessing it was. We sent that a few months later. Uh, they were having their usual summer meetings up on the mountain that they have down there. They invited us to come down, you know, and they came out and they, they put us up. They fed us. Uh, we had a, a tremendous week of, of, of meetings and prayer. Uh, it was a real blessing and something that helped to tie us together in that. Well, now, who knows? Somewhere down the road, something like that happens to us. People find out, God, that's how God does things. Yeah, okay, you know. Uh, I'm going to let you be blessed by doing this for them, and they are going to be blessed by you. you know, and if the thing is, we're, we're, you know, the whole body does this, or should be doing this, and so we all receive blessing from it, both receiving and in giving. Now, we're not under the law. We're under grace. It, that's why nothing is obligatory. Everything is to be by free will. What you choose. And that principle applies to all giving, to all vows, to all promises. Okay? So don't promise something you ain't going to do. Because <laughs> God is going to hold you to it. Okay? It's free will. Okay? It's not like being under the law. Praise God. All right? But you make a promise, you need to fulfill it. Okay? Now, for example, tithing can be used as a guide as a minimum of what one ought to be given. Okay? We are under the law. Tithing isn't something that we have. But, okay, if you want to say, what should I give? What should I commit myself to? Okay, well, the tithe is a good place to go. All right, that's what God, that was the principle God set of giving the tenth. And he said, you do that, I will bless you. All right, so that works well. But again, it's about a free will offering. Yeah, Kathy and I, as I said this morning, had, after we prayed, uh, looking at the situation in church and the finances, we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to make a promise to God that this is the minimum we're going to give. No matter what comes in or doesn't come in, we're going to give this much every month. Okay. And that's a promise we made to God. Now, it won't be to us if we don't do it. <laughs> you don't, you know, tell God something, make a promise to God, and then not keep it. All right? Uh, it's like me, when God called me to be a, a, a preacher, you know, yeah, it took me 25 years to get me into the pulpit, but God wasn't letting me out of it. <laughs> yeah. But this applies to everything. 
It applies to money. It applies to time. It applies to service. It applies to so many things. Luke 11:42. Luke 11:42. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to the Pharisees, the, the guys who are all about the law. And what's he tell them? But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue, which are spices, and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. He says, okay, so big deal. So you tithe. You know, again, the stuff gets brought to the priests, and, you know, offering gifts. And they're making, you know, they're tithing their spices. You know? uh, but he says, yeah, but what about the weightier things of God? He says elsewhere in one of the other Gospels in reference to this, you know, about judgment, right judgment, and love. Where are those things? What are you doing with those things? What are you giving of those things? What about your giving of love? What about, okay, we're talking about giving to God. Where's your love to God? Do you love on God? You know, do you praise God? Do you give thanksgiving to God? Do you give glory to the Lord. I, mean, I think he deserves it. I think he should get that from his children. You know, and then there's your giving of love and compassion and fellowship and prayers and support and edification to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you doing that? Do you give thought to that? You know, what's your motive behind it? You know, the free will offerings of your service, of your life. Because He is our life. That's in the scriptures. Our life is hid with God in Christ. That's our life. Without Him, we don't have life. And again, life and death are conditions of existence. And if we exist as living beings, it's because of the life that we were given by the Lord Jesus Christ, by His sacrificing of his life and his blood to provide us a means of reconciliation to God Almighty. Free will. Free will in your giving. But even beyond that, how about just being a volunteer? Just be, you know, uh, Isaiah who will go for us? I do. Here am I. Send me. <laughs> Be a volunteer. Yeah. Now, Bible says wisdom, prudence, don't vow and not pay. Yeah. But if you've made promises to God, you need to keep them. Because God is no one to be trifled with. God takes that very seriously. And as we saw, I mean, yeah, we can read the Bible and read about Achan. We can read about Ananias and Sapphira. And yet, yeah, that happened, you know, 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Okay, well, this guy Peter, that was last year. Okay, God hasn't changed. God has not changed. And that's exactly what cost this man his life here on earth was the fact that he made a vow before men and God and didn't keep it. 
that, how hard would it have been for him to keep that? You know what it was? It was his pride. It was his pride. You know, it was his pride that led him to split, help split that church. It was his pride that led him to declare himself as the pastor of the church. It was his pride that kept those people for all those years from joining back in with the church. You know what? After he died, <laughs> uh, the last holdout, finally, after all that time, the last holdout finally went and reconciled herself to Pastor Willie and to the church. And after that, a lot of the folks that had left completely started, and almost everybody who had been in that congregation there in New Guinea back in 2015 when this first began are all back together again in that church in its new location in downtown Weewak. One man was holding all that up. The church kept at the door open. We want you to come back. We want to be reckoned up. We, you know, he was the one that was keeping it apart. Yeah. And that's what got him killed. Now wrap it up. Ask yourself, have I made promises or vows to God that I haven't kept? If you have, then you need to go get right with God and you need to do what you need to do to keep those vows and promises. Why? Well, the question is, do you fear God? Do you fear God? I fear God. I have experienced in my own life, as some of you know from my testimony, what happens when you cross God. <laughs> you don't want to do it. Uh, and, I'm, and frankly, as far as I'm concerned, he was merciful. Okay? Okay, if you don't fear God, you would better. Okay? And if you haven't kept your promises, kept your vows, uh, done things that you said you were going to do, you had better. Because God takes our words very seriously. The question is, do you take what you say seriously? Do you fear God? You know, one of the great things missing in Christianity today is uh, God is seen as, you know, all you hear is the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. And yes, God is the epitome of love. God is the definition of real love. But God is a balanced God. He hates as much as he loves. You know? And just as fervently as he loves. And the fear of God is so incredibly non existent among the brethren that it's shameful. And the church needs to repent itself of that and remember who it is that has adopted them as his children. Father, and we have a privilege to call you Father. We've been given a privilege to come before your throne at will. We've been given gifts, promises, so many things by you. But as the hymn says, you know, it was grace that caused my heart to fear. And then it was grace my fears relieved because the cost to make it so was a great and horrible cost. And if we don't have the fear of God because of the sacrifice that was made, men are going to be held accountable for that. 
No one dies and goes to hell because of any sin they've committed, Father. We know that people who are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire are there for one reason and one reason only. And that's because they rejected, they spit upon the sacrifice that was made. And your wrath is going to be poured out on them because of that. Now, Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion, your long-suffering, and your mercy. And we need to remember who you are, what you are, and who we are. And what we are. And along with our love for you, we need to maintain the fear. If we fear you and we love you, then we will not experience the dread of you, the horror, the fright, the fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But as your children, it's joy and peace. Thank you, Lord, I pray, for these truths. Carry us safely as we go, Lord, now on our separate ways to our homes. Keep us safe as we travel. And in your will, bring us together again. And we pray and ask these things in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Shut down the camera. Hi, folks.